Hello Saints of God, thank you for tuning in to today's broadcast. Let's listen in to see what Pastor, Teacher Dr. James Sutton has to say today. Let's listen in. All right, welcome everybody to Walk and Truth Christian Fellowship Church uh, Bible Study, Dig Deeper Bible Study. Uh, I'm Pastor Dr. James Sutton. We will be studying 1 Peter. Uh, we've been studying for the past couple of weeks. It's been really good. And it's kind of interesting that a lot of us have been experiencing um, suffering well. That's what this whole book is about. It's about how to suffer well. After the persecution of Stephen, the church was persecuted and the church was dispersed into the different parts of Asia Minor. And uh, Peter, the Apostle Peter, is writing to the Gentile saints that have been dispersed, and he's telling them and reminding them that they're going to have to suffer. And he use, uses Christ's suffering as the example for us on how to suffer and how to be victorious. Today, we're going to go into one of the purposes for suffering is it helps us, uh, especially for Christ. And I want to make sure we talk about suffering for the sake of the gospel, suffering for Christ's sake, suffering due to persecution for Christ, for being a Christian, it helps us as we deal with it and as we perform through it and it builds our character uh, through faith and the suffering, we're going to see that it also helps us cease from sin. And it, and that's and that's actually hard to really put together in our minds that suffering helps us cease from sin. But hopefully I'll be able to explain that to you and you'll be able to see it clearly how that when we suffer for Christ, it actually puts us in position by faith that we cease from sin. So let's look at uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse uh, 18. Let's start at 18. We're going to read all the way through, through to the end, and then we'll go into 4 and 1, okay? Go ahead. For Christ also suffered once for sin, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, now at a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Amen. So now let's go over to four and one. And I want to talk about that. He, he took it all the way back to Noah on how it took Noah 120 years to build the ark. And he was preaching to those who were alive at the time. Noah was preaching and, and trying to get the world to commit a, a repent at the time. And they wouldn't. So God was patient and suffering. And Noah was an example of them suffering. Just imagine you're trying to save a people while you're trying to build an ark. While they are slandering you. And, and the world was just out of control at that time. And Noah is trying to preach to them about the oncoming doom of God. And remember, when God decides to bring judgment, a lot of times judgment is stayed because the people repent. We have that situation with Nineveh where uh, Jonah suffered through the affliction of the enemy and going, have to, going back to preach to them, suffering through that. His own psychological uh, 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 prejudices and biases of them being the enemy, he obeyed God unwillingly at first, but eventually he got around to doing what God wanted to do. But God let them live because they repented. Well, in Noah's situation, they didn't repent. And then eight people were saved. And we see that baptism now is associated with a nautical term, which means immersed in water. So baptism normally used in the Greek is used as a nautical term that is usually talked about ships being put into water, immersed in water. Now, when we see that, it, that baptism saves you and is different from washing well you think about it john's baptism was a washing of the outward flesh to to repentance jesus's baptism is an inward uh uh death that 
cleans us through salvation. So baptism itself, you might get confused by this, but baptism itself does not save. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit saves. So you have the water baptism and you have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Jesus was put to death and raised by the Spirit. The baptism, the putting into the ground is the baptism into death. And then he was raised by the Holy Spirit. So now we go into chapter 4. Go to chapter 4, verse 1. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh. See, and it goes, therefore means we must look back to what was said in the previous chapter. That's why I went to 18. Because we see that Christ suffered in the flesh and he was raised by the Spirit. Go ahead. Arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. Mm -hmm. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passion, but for the will of God. All right. So now we got a big difference. Now we have a situation where it tells us that therefore that 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 there is going to be a result. Therefore, uh, because Christ suffered in the flesh, arm ourselves. We get to arm ourselves with the what? Same way of thinking. Now, really that word thinking and that uh, Greek word thinking is really not thinking per se. It mo it's more like thought. It matches up with uh, Hebrews 4 and 12. Go to Hebrews 4 and 12 and read that. I'm going to show you what I'm talking about. Uh, arm yourself with the same resolve, meaning your same focus. Not just thinking in a sense of thinking about something, but arm yourself to be resolved. That's more what it's like. And 4 and 12 is the only place where this word is actually used in the New Testament, where this word uh, we use, that, that here is thinking, it's actually more like resolve, and they use a different word. So go ahead, read Hebrews 4 and 12, and you'll hear it. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. It's discerning. So it, 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 it's, it's not just discerning the thoughts, discerning the resolve, the resolve of the attention of the heart, the motives, the means, the, the way we think about things. Not so much thinking of the lofty things, but are you resolved to put on and be armed with this way of thinking that you're going to suffer? And that's a hard, it's just hard for us to believe that there's so much glory to God in suffering. Again, we're talking about suffering for the sake of Christ. We're not necessarily talking about the day-to-day -day suffering from the sin of Adam, of getting old and that kind of suffering. We're talking about the, the persecution that saints will go through when they uh, present themselves as Christians. Christ said we would suffer for his sake. And part of suffering for his sake is suffering through the presentation of the gospel to people who normally do not want to receive them. The gospel is counter counterintuitive to man's thinking because we know that man is born in sin and shaped in iniquity. We know that man is dead. The gospel is the light that gives life. And when light comes into darkness, a lot of times the darkness of the death runs away. It doesn't accept the light. So it takes God and the power of the Holy Spirit to show the person the light, to suffer through the gospel, and then begin to receive it. And then to realize as they live out the gospel in their life, as you become this living epistle of the gospel and the suffering of Christ, you're going to have to suffer through people too. You're going to have to long suffer with people, meaning that your patience should not run out of time when dealing with people who are difficult, who are talking against you, who are slandering you, who are putting you down, who don't understand you, who might have ought against you, not knowing that you have changed. See, you, you, you have to understand, you might have changed. You are a new creation, but it doesn't mean that all the people that you come in contact with throughout your time on this earth has seen the change. Or really cares to see the change. Because some people like to see you just the way they left you. And they like to harbor that feeling of, of resentment and hate towards you. And that's a form of persecution. Because once you have announced that you've changed, and, and, and really with each other, that's why I told us to put away the slander. Once we see the person has changed, once, we, once they say that they're a part of the body, then we watch them 
but we don't keep slandering them and trying to hold them to something that they said they've been changed from. We have to be patient with them and give them a little time because not too long ago, we were in the same situation, needing a God to love us to the point of death. This greater love than this that no man has than to give his life for his friend that we may do the same and long suffer through dealing with each other. It is so important that saints do this because through that suffering, that's the way we show love towards one another. That's the way God has picked to identify us as disciples, the way we love each other. And part of the love equation is to suffer. Uh, and we see that uh, it tells us that we arm ourselves and we suffer. Verse one, it said in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. I just talked about that. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Now that's a whole different concept. So what God is trying to explain is, and I'm going to try to make this as simple as possible. When we are suffering for Christ's sake, we're being persecuted for his sake, which means we're doing good in our suffering. While we're doing good, evil is always present, right? So while we're doing good, being persecuted and suffering through, suffering with, suffering because we're Christians, at that point, by faith, we are actually doing good in the suffering. So while we're suffering, you're doing good. When you're suffering and you're showing the fruit of the spirit towards that person, towards that circumstance, incident, or accident, when you suffer through that for the sake of Christ, at that point, you're doing good. It, it, is, it, it is so simple. As I'm pursuing Christ and suffering for his sake, remember we talk about pursue righteousness like a hunter. We talked about that Sunday. Pursue this thing called righteousness. Well, as we pursue righteousness and suffer for pursuing it, then we are actually doing good and therefore we have ceased from sin. Not, and that makes sense. When I'm doing good under God's umbrella of the sanctification process, I actually have ceased from sin at that point because my deeds are around the things of Christ. They're not necessarily for me it's actually exhibited towards others. The love that I exhibit towards you as my fellow brother and sister Christ, I'm going to be long-suffering with you and for you, actually helps me at that point in time to cease from sin. It doesn't mean that, that I'm completely free of it, but what it means is I made a choice to suffer. So you make a choice to suffer for the sake of Christ. That's an a, a act of the will. So when I willfully suffer for the sake of Christ, with my brothers and sisters and other people, then I cease from sin in that moment, in that mindset, in that resolve. I am resolved to help you no matter what. I am resolved to, to, to give you a cup of water if you're my enemy, no matter what. I am resolved to make it right if I can, no matter what. Those thoughts that, 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 that go hand in hand with action actually push you in a place where you, you are showing your sanctification. You are ceasing from sin. It's an ongoing process. It doesn't happen overnight. Okay? Uh, read verse 2 again. So as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for, for the will of God. See? So you no longer live for the rest of your time in the flesh. You look for opportunities to suffer, do right by God, under God, you, you arm yourself with his kind of thought process. You're looking around for opportunity to suffer through the fact your flesh doesn't want to do the things of God. See, you got to remember, your war is going on inside of you. So when you start doing stuff to please God, your flesh says, no, I want to go back to doing what I used to do. So this war, this war is going on with inside of you that ceases you from sin. You got to remember, there is a natural pull, the world, the flesh, and the devil are trying to pull you back into what you used to be. And there's times, as we know, before I go any further, there's times when what we used to be comes out. But remember, I told you, it's like the volume on the radio. As you walk more with God, as you suffer more with God, as you learn to suffer well through people, the, the, the action that causes you to turn up the volume of your old self should be turned down by the power of the Holy Spirit and you submitting to that. See, you can only learn to suffer well as, as well as you submit to the Holy Spirit. An act of the will to follow the things of God. 
to activate the fruit of the spirit in your life. You have to fan those flames and activate this as a will in your life, as a way that you do things. You don't, you don't, you don't pursue the passions of your flesh. Okay? Even though you're still here, you're still in this flesh, but you're learning to subject your flesh to the Holy Spirit. You're, you're actually doing what Adam was born in. He was born in the spirit subjecting it subjected he's born his flesh was subjected to the holy spirit what i'm trying to say he was living in the spirit that's why he didn't realize he was naked because his spirit ruled his flesh once adam sinned the flesh became the dominant thing and we've been living under that sin so as we're being sanctified part of the sanctification process being conformed to his image remember he was raised in the spirit remember that in, in chapter three it talked about him being raised in the spirit. Likewise, you're being raised up, edified in the spirit, grown up in the spirit. And as you submit to the will of God through the power of the Holy Spirit, you won't spend time chasing your flesh anymore. There are some things that you used to do once you come to Christ that shouldn't have any effect on you. It doesn't mean that your appetite is not, is not there yet, but there are some things that it, you shouldn't, you, your flesh shouldn't be hungry for anymore. You know, your flesh shouldn't even go after anymore because you've surpassed that. OK, so we don't we don't uh, fall prey to our all. It says no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. See, it's a spiritual thing. Human passions is flesh. Will of God. What is it? Spirit. OK, so we, we've actually turned the corner. It says we have the power to turn the corner to follow the will of God through submitting through the Holy Spirit, through suffering. It all works together. Now, we do this by faith. We do this by faith. We don't work to gain the will of God. We work because we have faith in God and what he did at the cross. Everything starts at the cross. So as we appreciate the cross more and the suffering that it took to get at the cross, you think about this. When the Jews saw Jesus, and I, and I discussed this with some other people, when the Jews saw Jesus going to the cross, and you think about the road to Emmaus, the witnesses talked about the fact that they killed the Christ, and they seen the risen Christ, but they didn't glorify in his death or his resurrection. It was a sad thing, and if you read the Gospels closely, it took a little while for the disciples, the apostles, to believe in the resurrection. Because even Jesus told them that he would come back. They didn't really believe. That's why they went on about their business. They thought they had been defeated. But we live on the other side of the resurrection. The glory of the resurrection. We get buried in his death. And we participate in his suffering. But our glory is that he rose again. See that suffering le led to a rising again. So those who are dead in Christ. Who never accept Christ. They will die in their suffering and never know what it's like to rise from that grave of suffering, that grave of sin. What we have done is when we come to Christ, the imputed righteousness of Christ puts us in position to, to be, ro be raised, rose again to a new life. So we experience the new life here, but we also looking forward because of his resurrection, not his death anymore. His death is done. It is finished. He accomplished the, the connection to bring us back into fellowship with God with his death. Now with his resurrection, we walk in the newness of that. And that newness goes against our flesh, goes against our natural man. And now what happens is there's a war going on inside of us. And a lot of times the war spills out into the world, the world, the flesh and the devil. The devil uses the world to tempt us. Just like Jesus when he was tempted when he was fasting and took up in the pinnacle okay so we have to understand that go to verse three for the time that is past suffices for doing what the gentiles want to do living in sensuality passions drunkenness orgies drinking parties and lawless idolatry now it's funny that was written over two thousand years ago and that's pertinent now. Isn't that what America's about now? Orgies, drinking parties, drunkenness, passions, 
sensuality, you know, sex rules the day. Illicit sex is the best sex. What they call it being fluid, meaning that you can go have sex with anybody. Uh, don't make a difference what gender, as long as both everybody wants it. That's the state of America today. That's the state of America. If that's not America, and again, that wasn't written to be prophetic. That's the nature of sinful man without God. It hasn't changed. The lust of our eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. It hasn't changed over 2,000 years. So when we break these caveats in and talk about them people, those people, the rich people, the poor people, the black people, the white people, and, 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 and relegate these qualities to a certain ethnic group, no. This is mankind's problem. Drunkenness, passions, uh, drinking parties, orgies, living sensuality, lawlessness, idolatry. That is a problem for a man. But when you pursue in God, now think about this. This is what the world's like. And you feel with the Holy Spirit. You're going to have a problem. And if you don't have a problem, you might want to check. Are you still like this? Because if, if the world is like this, it's not, it is not uh, buffing up against you, pushing up against you, pushing you back, challenging you, then you might have an identity crisis where you might not be saved because the world loves you. Jesus said, the world hates me and it's going to hate you. Well, why is it these are the qualities of the world? Why, do you, why does the world feel more comfortable with you? Because you still may be practicing such things. And again, you can be delivered from them, but some of this stuff you have to actually willfully, purposely get into the word of God, follow, yield to the Holy Spirit, and turn away from these things. You don't play with it. You don't go near it. You, you don't go near it trying to save somebody. And you barely, you got out of it yourself. You actually just stay away from it. You know, the cliche, just say no. Yeah, I'm not saying it's not easy, but it's easier the more you yield to the power of the Holy Spirit and the love of God. When I think about the love of God, when I suffer, when I look at his suffering and go, go spiritually into his suffering, it is hard for me to sin. It's hard for me to sin. All I have to do is think about what he did for me because I appreciate it. Now, if you don't have any appreciation and you think you deserve salvation, then you have another whole different problem because if you think that you deserve it just because you're here, then... You actually, it's not grace, it's a work. And God's works his love through grace. Okay? By grace through faith are you saved. So this grace and faith also puts you in a position to willfully yield to the Holy Spirit. Okay? So you won't participate in these things. Go to verse 4. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery. So there's a rub. With respect to what we just read, all the things that the world has, it says that 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 they are surprised. Is anybody surprised when you don't participate in that stuff? Are they surprised when you don't decide to go back and do what you used to do? Are they surprised when you say, no, I'm not going to do that? Now, I understand sometimes you got to, you know, because you're not as strong in your resolve, as we talked about at the beginning, they'll resolve that thinking that you just be playing with them and tell them no. But sometimes you just go ahead and you make up a reason why you can't. And again, I applaud you for that because that's you're starting on your way. But the goal is to get you to say, you know what? I don't do that no more. And if they ask you why don't you do it, then you could, then you could tell them for the hope that lies. You can talk about the hope that lies within you. Now you're about to suffer through people you used to hang with they're surprised that you're not doing what you used to do. And now they got two choices. Either they can accept you or they leave, or they go against you. Now, if they go against you, you still have the opportunity and the responsibility to at least give them the reason why you've changed. You owe them that because if you don't, you kind of leave them hanging. Because trust me, when you're doing the things of God, and you used to be out in these streets and you run into the people in these streets again. They may see the God holiness in you, but a lot of times they want you to tell them your story because think about this. They're just like you. So just as God saved you and you heard the gospel, you're the person supposed to give them the gospel. 
when you run into them and they ask why, what happened. So don't be surprised when they push back against you. And again, don't be surprised if they don't really believe that you saved and they want to come against you and try to get pulled you back in. All of us probably experienced that one where they'll say, okay, yeah, you saved, all right. And they find that thing that used to turn you on to get you to go back into that world and they put it right in front of your face, more stronger, better than it ever was. And you have to have your mind made up to resolve to suffer through that. Now, that's persecution. See, temptation is persecution because you're fighting against it. Okay? Temptation is a form of persecution because you're trying to fight against it. And as you try to fight against it, guess what? The, the, the temptation that turns into an act of doing this, this debauchery is sin. But when you fight against it, you're doing what is good and godly. You see? You're suffering through the temptation, the pressure, the peer pressure, the, the, the fact that you may be ostracized so you could do the will of God. Go ahead. Five. Right. And they malign you. And they malign you. Malign means talk critically against you with spite. Talk critically against you with spite. So this is the end of you doing what's right by God following your conscience, having a resolve to suffer, having a resolve to do right, they might malign you. There you go. And what is malignment? Another word, they might slander you. Instead of coming with you, they might talk against you and talk badly about you and lie on you to malign you. You in line and they want to malign you, take you out of line. Talk to talk to you spite talk about you spitefully to others, lie on you, exaggerate some things about you, not believe in the fact. That, and see, the badge of honor is they're maligning you. See, if they start maligning you and you know that you suffered and tried to do right by them and and, and explain to them your new creature, who you are in Christ Jesus. Now, if you've done that and they malign you, remember we've been reading you. That shows that you are part of God's family. See, it's not when everybody say you good and godly and running around patting you on the back. It's when those who are outside of the body know that you saved and they hate you so much that they don't want to get saved. They want to talk critically against you spitefully. See, that's when you know you on your way. Not when everybody walking around, hey, you know, that's good brother and sister. Okay, yeah, that's that's good and fine. But are there but there's other people out here who on the oh are the enemies of Christ recognize the Holy Ghost in you, recognize the Spirit of God in you, that they malign you. They can't be saved. Look at them. I remember what they used to be. Matter of fact, church, we know we're going through that right now in some situations where people can't believe that you change just because of what they believe you were or what you used to do. And then you might have done all of that. Matter of fact, let's go on and say. Everything everybody accused you of before you were saved, you did. That's great. Because now that means that Jesus did a mighty work in you. Amen. Let's say everything you, everything everybody accused you of before you were saved, you did. You're guilty of that. And Jesus has saved you, changed you, made you a new creature. You're walking upright, following the things of God. Then God has done a mighty work and we need to give God some praise for that. Malign us. We, we love it when you malign us because we know we're not good for it and you're doing it because you're, you're the, your father, the devil. See, the, the devilish people do those things. And I hate to say this, but the devils are in the church visible. They're not in the church invisible. The church invisible is perfect. But the church visible, you because that's why he told us, we need to put away slander. We shouldn't even have that sins in the word of God. Why do we need to put away slander? Because sometimes we take those characteristics to feel important, to, to, to gain favor, and people love bad news rather than good news. And they just got to have something to talk about. So you got people in the body, so-called body of Christ, inside the church four walls, inside the church organization, attached to the ministry that'll sit there and slander people for no reason at all. All because they haven't yielded to the power of the Holy Spirit. Go ahead. But, but, they, but they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. So we got that back in, I think, uh, 1 Peter 3.15, where it talks about 
when they do this to you, they're going to have to give an account. So they're not going to get away with it, say. That's the part that you have have to have to have to be comfortable with in your in your mind that that you're not looking for retribution. You're not looking for justice on the spot. Justice will come later because they will have to give an answer to the God Almighty himself, Jesus Christ himself, for maligning, slandering, and persecuting his children. Remember what Jesus told Paul. He told Paul, I'm going to show you how much you're going to have to suffer for my sake. And if you go back and I want you to do this, read Acts chapter 7, starting with the stoning of Stephen and Paul's, uh, Paul's implication in that, all the way through 9 and 10, where once Paul gets saved, he goes back to try to pe preach to the people about his newness. And they were scared of Paul and they wanted to get rid of Paul and they arrested Paul because they didn't want to accept Paul in his change, okay? He had to go away for some years and come back. Well, same thing with you. They still going to be held accountable for slandering Paul, not so much the first time, but when he came back, after he had spent some time. You know, sometimes it takes people a minute to see the God in you, but you're talking about a couple of years down the line, and you see them again, and they still slandering you or holding you to account of what you used to be. Now, there's a natural, remember, I tell you this all the time, there's a natural consequence to your actions, and you may need to go back and apologize to some people. You know, you just forgot about it over time, and now it comes up to you again years later. Well, then you go ahead and do the will of God. Long suffer and go and apologize. Go put the ball back in their court. Don't you carry and don't you let your ego and your pride and your idolatry of yourself say, I'm holy now, I don't have to do this. No, if it comes up, you need to take care of it. And then when you take care of it, you're done with it. Then they're back to either believing you or maligning you. And if they, whether they believe you or my, maligning you, you are doing the will of God and you cease from sin. Okay, verse six. For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead. That though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. Now, 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 now. think about this. You're judged in the flesh for the way you are. Okay? You're judged in the flesh for the way you are. Okay? What are you? You're dead in your sins and trespasses. You deserve to go to hell. Okay. Now Christ died to give you a different life that you may live in the spirit. So your flesh has been judged guilty as charged. You deserve to die and be separated from God forever. But Christ died that you believe in that, that you may have eternal life and be reunited, reconciled with God. So we have the, 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 the suffering by faith that keeps us cease, cease from sin, ongoing as we live out the rest of our life, not falling back into the life of debauchery, idolatry, sensuality. By faith, we enter into this union with Christ that allows us to put our flesh to death. Our flesh is crucified and we do that daily that we may live in the spirit. So there we have it. We have the ability by our will to move out of the things of the flesh and move into the spirit of God. Again, for this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead. Remember, Christ went down and preached the gospel to those who were held captive, okay? Who are dead, that through, that though judged, in the flesh, being judged in the flesh, in the way people are, everybody, Jew, Gentile alike, they, they what? They might live in the spirit, okay? They might live in the spirit the way God does. So the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, which transforms 
the ones who are dead in dead to Christ to now being dead in Christ to be risen in Christ in the spirit. And our hope is, is in our resurrection, in, the, in him coming back and our next resurrection with our glorified bodies to receive our rewards for living out the rest of our life in the fruit of the spirit, long suffering and not living out in the passions of our flesh. So the gospel is always preached. The gospel of grace, the gospel of deliverance, the gospel of resurrection, the gospel of reconciliation is preached to people who are separated from God, who are the dead people. And though that is the only means by which they could live in the spirit. Living in the spirit is living on the power of the Holy Spirit with God. Okay? So God had to do this with men. Men were dead in sins and their trespasses. And God had to be had to exact his justice. But he wanted to give mercy. But he had to have his justice. Well, you think about it to bridge the gap between his justice that he had to do by his word for those who sin, because it says a soul that sin must die. He had to create, it was created something called grace. Grace is that go between that bridges his justice and his mercy. When you say, pastor, how was that? He poured out his justice on Jesus so that he could give his grace to us. Amen. So that you know no longer have to live under your passion. You can live under the spirit of God. So the grace actually come out of his justice, him suffering to receive the justice that was due to us so that we may receive the grace and his mercy and his pardon. God poured out the wrath that was due to mankind on his son. And as we head toward Easter, we're going to talk about that more and more because it's so important because you can't exhaust it. And because he's done this, we still here have to suffer in our flesh, those of us who believe in Christ. So don't think it's strange when somebody comes at you and challenges you and maligns you and talk against you and slander you. And you look at it as I'm not doing nothing to them. Yes, you are. You are showing the light of Christ to a dark, dead person. And you would think dead people knowingly we want to be alive but that's not true because some people want to stay right where they at and they believe through false teaching that they're going to be okay or they believe that they can do the, the deathbed confession the thief on the cross confession but the fact that that when they hear the truth of the gospel their time is ticking because it's not guaranteed that even if they stay alive that God would not say you knew the truth and you turned away from the truth. And I ratified your decision a year ago, 10 years ago, whereas you didn't want to return to me and you haven't turned to me. So let's realize, saints of God, in this suffering well, that when we suffer well, when we do the things of God, when we follow the power of the Holy Spirit, we're going to be talked about, we're going to be maligned, we're going to be slandered, but what we're going to do is raise above the fray, give God the glory, because that suffering helps build our character. That suffering, as we act upon in, act upon the suffering by faith, helps us cease from doing sin. A lot of times, it takes a sacrifice to do good. It takes a sacrifice to do good. And so when we sacrifice, we're being just like Christ. When we love like Christ, and we love and sacrifice and suffering in this world, with the people that's in this world and ourselves, then we cease from sin and we actually are having the mind of Christ, the mind of obedience, yielding to the power of the Holy Spirit no matter what is happening. So let's pray. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, I just thank you today. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your people. Lord, continue to teach us how to suffer long and well. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you for tuning in to Walk with True Christian Fellowship Church broadcast. I always want you to be encouraged, be blessed, and be at peace. And always remember, walk in the truth of the Lord. Thank you.
If you do not have a place of worship, please consider Walk in Truth Christian Fellowship Church your home. We are safe place to worship, supporting the edification of the body with all of its gifts. Sound biblical teaching is at the center of our worship as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Sharing the fruit of the Spirit and moving forward in faith through serving our community is our privilege and pleasure. Please feel free to contact the ministry at 636-344-0539 or email us at witmin at yahoo.com. Thank you for your consideration, be blessed, encouraged and walk in the truth of the Lord. We worship at the Universal Church of Jesus Christ Building, located at 2301 Wallace Avenue, Overland, Missouri, 63114. The times of worship are 8.30 a.m. on Sunday and 7 p.m. on Tuesday. You may also join us on Facebook at the Walk in Truth Christian Fellowship page or the Walk in Truth Radio Network YouTube page. All are welcome and we look forward to teaching you the truth about God, teaching you to be committed, accountable, and responsible to the things of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit.